Thank you all for coming to the uh, University Writing Program of uh, University of uh, Washington Tacomas. Uh, and thank you for, this is our third year doing this, and this is the second speaker in the symposium series. Um, we have two every year, so we're very grateful for uh, Dr. Kirkland to come uh, and give this talk. And I know you're gonna enjoy it. The, the faculty workshop this, uh, this morning was fantastic. We all had a really great time uh, and learned a lot. Uh, okay, so let me begin. Uh, Dr. David E. Kirkland is an activist, educator, cultural critic, author, and executive director of the New York University Metropolitan Center for Research on Equity and the Transformation of Schools. He earned his PhD from Michigan State University and his JD from the University of Michigan. He's a native of Detroit and his scholarship explores intersections among race, gender, and literacy education. With many groundbreaking publications to his credit, he has analyzed the cultures, languages, and texts of urban youth using critical literacy, ethnography, and sociolinguistics research methods to answer complex questions at the center of equity and social justice in education. Dr. Kirkland has taught middle, middle and high school in Michigan, organized youth empowerment and youth uh, mentoring programs for over a decade in cities like Detroit, Chicago, and New York and currently leads efforts to enhance educational op opportunities and options for vulnerable youth throughout New York City, particularly in the South Bronx. Dr. Kirkland uh, has received many awards for his research in educational activism, including the 2016 Era Division G Mid-Career Scholars Award, the 2008 Era Division um, G Outstanding Dissertation Award. He, wa he was a 2009 to 10 Ford Foundation Postdoctoral Fellow, a 2011 to 12 NAED um, Spencer Foundation postdoctoral fellow and is a former fellow of the National Council of Teachers of English, Research Foundation's Cultivating New Voices Among Scholars of Color program. Of his many books and publications, A Search Past Silence, The Legacy, or excuse me, The Literacy of Black Males has been a teacher's uh, college press bestseller and winner of the 2015 Daniel E. Griffiths Research Award, the 2014 a, um, ESA Critics' Choice Award, and the 2014 NCTE David H. Russell Award for Distinguished Research in the Teaching of English. He's also the co-editor of the newly released studies um, um, Students' Rights to Their Own Language, a critical source book published by Bedford and St. Martin's. In a July Huffington Post article, Dr. Um, Kirkland offers several personal and ideological and structural solutions to many to the many overlapping problems in our schools and society that Black Lives Matter has revealed and made more obvious to a wider public. I'd like to end this introduction on one of his solutions because I think it gives a small indication of Dr. Kirkland's many important insights and contributions um, to education. He says this, it's a little long. In order, that is, it's long, I don't want you to think I'm, it's my, my words. <laughs> I don't mean it's long-winded, sorry, that sounded bad. <laughs> In order to redress the consequences of systems of ideological injustice, we must promote a campaign of ideological justice where we renew an importance to heightening our humanity through formal systems of education. With this, we must demand that formal education endorse curricula that critiques and disrupts hegemony and white privilege, white supremacy, and the logics of Western Eurocentrism and all of its associated logics, including racism, misogyny, patriarchy, xenophobia, colonialism, and so on. Just as we wouldn't allow students to finish school unable to read or write, we must let, excuse me, we mu mu we, why we must let students finish school unable to love or accept others. Thus, we must demand more from our schools. We must insist that the greater goals of education deal with fostering fully humanized citizens, sensitive to, our, um, to other humans, people who are fully responsive to how we might live with others in our world we share. Dr. Kirkland reminds us that we must be explicit about the ways we attack racism, sexism, xenophobia, and the many other ills that plague our school systems and teaching. Additionally, he says that doing so humanizes our work, students, and even ourselves. This is how I think we make something like Black Lives Matter in writing in the academy. So without further ado, I present Dr. David E. Kirkland.
I want to thank my dear brother and colleague for um, his kind introduction. Thank you so much. And I want to thank you all for laboring out. I was glad when I had the opportunity and I got the email about visiting this school and giving a talk here. I give about 50 or so talks a year. And the thing that I know as I go around the country is that while the world might be in peril, whenever I get to engage individuals in rooms like this, I feel the hope because we are that hope. Unfortunately, however, in order to progress the hope, we have to be committed to conversations like this. So I've decided to make this conversation a little bit more personal. Because we know, as Chimamanda Adichie reminds us, that stories matter. Many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign. But stories can be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. Before I start to talk about literacy and writing and the lenses right, that, that gives us some type of um, view into those practices, I want to share a story because I think that stories matter. And I want to share a story of a student because in this work I want to center students because the work is really about the students. And in centering those students, I want to begin to talk about vulnerable students, the students that we too often fail. And I want to beg a set of questions about how we might begin to succeed them. So please indulge me while I share a story with you about a student, the student that I know best, me. Get over here, punk. We're going to whoop your ass talking all that shit in class. Now what's up? Hey, man, catch that nigga. He getting away. Where did he go? Those were the last words I heard those boys say. The last I saw of them were the mounting fists pouring upon my head. This had become too routine in my neighborhood. Every day a posse or gang of boys would choose someone to assault. That day I was their selection, but I was running, and the three large boys didn't catch me. This was the single code of living on Detroit's east side. That is, do whatever it takes to survive. I didn't understand why those dudes were chasing me. I had heard one of them mention that they were going to get me next for showing off in class. But all I had done was answer a few questions that our teacher raised. For that, they teased me, calling me a teacher-pleasing nerd. Here I was again, running. It became all too common now. Whenever I was afraid, I ran. Whenever I was in any trouble, I ran. Now again, I found myself running. Running was my way of coping with the brutal situation of a depleted city. I hadn't witnessed the fall of Detroit. It probably took place years before my birth. Yet I lived daily in its death. I participated in its funeral. I carried its tomb. Detroit was no longer a mecca for the economic upliftment of people. By the mid-1980s, the city had been transformed into a dark urban dungeon that fettered people into an, into an existence comparable to slavery. All the days that I lived in Detroit, I felt enslaved. The event of being jumped and beaten for no reason was just another example of my thraldom. My running was simply an attempt to find freedom. That day, I run home to my mother. She is a beautiful woman with blazing brown eyes. Her, comp her complexion is a sparkling bronze, and her features were what the Bible terms strength and dignity. Standing no higher than four feet nine inches to me, she was like looking into a mirror. Many times I've been told how much I resembled my mother. But she alone cared for my sister and me and had our company in her suffering. The city did not deal well with single mothers, especially those like my mother, untamed and somewhat possessed by wild spirits. For this freedom, she didn't work a job. Instead, she was demoted to social patient status, victimized by the cruel asylum of the welfare program that the state afforded many of these, quote, unfortunate, un unquote, cases. Every year that my mother participated in that program, her conscience shivered like a junkie's and her soul bled red like the burning embers of coal. She became somewhat of a dependent child herself on this program and then on others. You see, my mother was a prostitute. 
So when I returned to her home, I found her standing by the time-beaten screen door that hung before her front wall. She was standing there, shouting those words, screaming them as she argued with one of her friends. You simple motherfucker, get the hell out of my house. If you ain't got no money, it ain't shit you can get here. I got two kids I'm trying to raise, and I don't need some lazy nigga sucking the life out of me. Lena, why you tripping? I don't need to take this shit from you, you silly bitch. And then he slapped her across her beautiful face. It seemed as though he had slapped away some of her beautiful features. Portions of the gold and bronze doled in their splendor. I was angry, but afraid. I ran into her house to my room. I could not understand why she had let him slap her. I could not re um, resolve why my seven-year-old man-child self could not protect my mother. I could not resolve why when he had slapped her, I felt the blunt force behind the thrust of his blast. I could not resolve why the sound of the slap was magnified, as though the echoes of the three large boys beating me in my head had reached my mother. I could not resolve why all of this was happening, why it seemed to happen so often, so abundantly. As I sat in my room alone, I began to cry. My tears formed into words, settled into poetry. They pasted my boyhood thoughts into a contingency of spots, a notebook charged with monitoring my life. The tears spilled and the pages captured their water and words. And I cried and wished that someday there would come an end to the strife that followed me. So I created a world of my own in my room. It was a place that only I understood. It was a place um, that only I understood. It was a place that separated me from the rest of the world. More importantly, it separated me from my concerns. I had a bed in my room which seemed to get more comfortable as each night passed. It was given to my mother by a sister who had recently bought her son's new beds. I took the bed that my mother gave me and transformed it into a vehicle that allowed me to travel in my sleep. Here I dreamt of peace and happiness. I explored moments of solace, times when children would compliment me for being intelligent instead of beating me. I bore witness to the freedom of imagination, the steel scene of this concept, freedom, which was so vivid in my imagination became my destination. Although I ran steel, the barb of my knees now pointed in this direction. I knew from my dreams that freedom was far from where I stood. It was hidden in a place where my imagination had taken me. It was in a place buried deeply within my dreams. It was not in Detroit. As I sat in my room, I heard a loud cry. It was my mother. She was running through the house as if someone were chasing her, screaming that unfulfilled question, why? The depth of her tears were as oceans touching skies, surrendering rain. They were like small images of hope that baptized her troubled soul and cleansed her naked spirit. I watched my mother from the door of my room. I watched her and a tear passed by my eye. She looked at me. I think she saw the bruises barren upon my forehead. She began to walk toward me. She came into my room, sat on the side of the bed next to me, and continued to cry. I grabbed her with all the sympathy in my arms and held her there. She lay there, crying like a baby in my arms, and fell asleep. I held her until she awakened. While she slept, I discovered the imprint of a man's hand on the side of her face. It was an awful bruise that now made me ask, why? I was then reminded of what she had once told me about living in a city. You're in a ghetto, boy. Don't nobody care about how you feel. You got to do what it takes to survive. But I did care what others felt. More importantly, I cared about how she felt and wondered why anyone had to live in the ghetto. I want to thank you all for listening to my story while I share it. Thank you. I share this story for a few reasons. As I said before, because I want to talk about writers. And I want to talk about the types of writers that we usually don't talk about, that we sometimes talk through. The types of writers, you know, um, who are told when they're in school that they cannot write and they will not grow up to be writers. The lesson that I was told. And, but even then, words receded in my imagination. They were pronounced in my dreams and my thoughts. And they lingered in ways that the writing classroom could not contain. I left that space in these spaces with questions. Why isn't the writing classroom big enough to fit me and my story? And I've learned that I'm not alone in that, right? As I began to do research, I, and I began to meet, you know, um, young men like me. Like this young man, Derek Todd. 
I sat in his writing classroom for about a year, conducting research on the literacies of black, black males. And Derek's teacher, she would come to me from time to time and she, said, she would say, Professor Kirkland, Professor Kirkland, what can I do to get Derek to write? Because Derek was one of those writers who had been silenced by the classroom. He had been told so often that he was not a reader or a writer. And so I said, hey, why don't you allow him to write about himself in a way that makes sense to him? And so for the next writing assignment, they, they, the class were um, to write narratives with beginning, middles, and ends. And the teacher said, well, the next um, writing assignment is a narrative project. I said, well, allow these students to write in a genre that makes sense to them. I know that Derek is an MC and a spoken word poet. He loves that genre. Some reservations, she took my advice and she allowed the class to write. Derek, for the first time in her class, wrote, and he wrote this. U-turn, left behind legs sprawling on top of black back mountains, rivers that run deep like Sheba's queens, and she loves open pores inside empty cups that run over. Hope like escalades that faint in darkness, that freeze in night, that frickin' morning, morning uprising, light skin, white men, blues as my brothers, black as my berry, sweet as my juice. So you turn back to me, I return back to you, I die daily for you. Whew. Remember, Derek didn't write. He didn't write, he wrote this. I was like, well done, Dr. Kirkland. Patted myself on the back. Like I earned my paycheck. I was excited. Because what we know about um, writing and literacy theory is that if we begin to, you know, invite those proclivities, those ways of writing into classrooms, students who don't tend to write will surprise us. And the teacher did this. She outcast his sensibilities in his writing in the classroom. When she saw his paper, she struck a line through the U and U turn. She told him that his use of English, I mean, his use of um, sprawling was broken English, told him to use it correctly, corrected his use of pores and light, and she told him he was lazy. She told him he was lazy. And we know that there are tragic consequences to this. Now, mind you, this was a good intention teacher, a good intention teacher who invited a professor, researcher into her classroom to understand this variable of literacy among a group of vulnerable students. This was a good intention teacher who allowed him to write in a way that made sense to him. This was a good intention teacher who created an assignment, a narrative assignment to um, allow for the spoken word poetry that this young man was prolific at. This was a good intention teacher who struck red ink through his page. And we know that there are consequences to this. Like the idea uh, that only 25% of black men and boys score proficiently in first year writing, compared with 82% of their white peers. And we even know Hispanic and Asian students fare better than black males, even when English is their second language. That these young men are at the bottom or near the bottom of all academic achievement categories and are grossly overrepresented among students who do not persist to graduation. So in a sense, their academic destinies are directly tied to our pedagogies and our practices. And I can take it farther because these consequences do linger. Their lives the fundamentals of their lives are directly related to the consequences of our pedagogy. According to research, nearly 40% of 
will be jobless, either unemployed or incarcerated. By 2020, it's almost like flipping a coin. And what's worse are the death statistics that mirror these systems where we fail them. Black men ages 10 to 14 have shown the largest increase in suicide rates since 1980 compared to other youth groups by sex and ethnicity, increasing at about 180%. Among 15 to 19 year old black males, suicide rates um, have increased by 80%. Black males are twice as likely to die before um, the age of 45 as white males. And I'm only using black males here as a case. We can put any other vulnerable student group in the same situation. That at at the point that we provide access and opportunity and delete that access and opportunity without a, you know, um, a response that moves beyond a deficit theory, we can't do violence. Ta-Nehisi Coates said the violence was such that the classroom was a jail of other people's intentions for him. So I sat on a question after I'd left that class for a while. Remember, this is a good intention teacher. I don't want to beat up on teachers and, and instructors because we get beat up on enough. She was good. She's a good intention teacher. My question is, why didn't she value his poem? I'm about to be a professor a little bit, but I'm a cool professor, so follow me. (laughs) I'm going to talk about the politics of culture. We know that culture can be used and is used as a um, sociopolitical currency for the exchange of values, beliefs, and dispositions. And for each of us, it's also an essential part of who we are. So when the red ink goes through his page, his cultural expression, that red ink penetrates Derek, who after he wrote that poem in that class, didn't write in that class again. And here we know that some cultures are valued more than others. Therefore, certain individuals are perceived to have greater worth in society than others. That certain ways of writing are valued more than other ways of writing. Certain forms of language are valued over other forms of language. Even when, you know, um, those genres and that language can communicate equally the message that is necessary. And we know even when we shift, that this target is constantly shifting, amended by some elite group to reflect them, their interests, their language, and their cultures. That some of the rules of the game that we've constructed are arbitrary. And even though they may be capricious, they have consequences that create systems of disparity that persist, that outline disproportionalities where, you know, some of our students make it and other ones don't, where some of them persist and others don't. We got research now that suggests within college writing, you can more accurately um, predict based on the grade in a first year writing course, who will graduate college and who won't. The consequences of cultural politics. According to Antonio Gramsci, it's this idea of hegemony. And hegemony is the success of some dominant group in projecting their values, dispositions, and interests, whereby we, the masses, consent to multiple forms of oppression. Some of us tell our students to, you know, to write in standard English. You gotta learn standard English. We don't even know why we tell them they gotta learn standard English. Most of this conversation, I haven't even used standard English. And you still feel me. And we tell them, tell them, use standard English. You, you got to use standard English. You got to learn standard English. Because if you learn standard English, you're going to do better in the world. No, you're not. But if you learn to effectively communicate, you will. 
The question here is, why did we buy into this form of oppression? What is the hegemonic mechanism or message that, that, that has captivated this idea of standard English only, as opposed to effective communication? I was in a conversation. Um, I got a chance to introduce Toni Morrison once. Give my introduction of Dr. Morrison. She comes up on stage and she begins speaking to everyone in French. I'm like, oh my God, this woman knows French. Then she starts, starts to speak in like this magical realist language, then this high academic language, and she would throw in some Ebonics here and there. She's translanguaging across this field of, you know, um, linguistic flexibility. And I'm like, my goodness, she's, she's amazing. But it wasn't standard English. It was effective communication. And yet, hegemonically, we teach this thing that has multiple forms of oppression, what I've called in my own work displacement ideologies, silencings and fears, hatreds of self and others, feelings of inferiority and superiority, entitlement and disentitlement. In the workshop this morning, we tried some of these ideas out. Through an activity, I was able to silence some. Didn't I? Fears. Hatreds of self and others, feelings of inferiority and superiority, entitlement and disentitlement. These are all part of, you know, the constellation of pedagogical realities that define the writing classroom. Who gets to be voiced or heard and who is silent? Who hates themselves and who don't? Who feels superior like they belong? or inferior, like they don't, entitled or disentitled. And it's come to my mind that all of this is tied to a set of benign ideologies, like missionary models and deficit theories. The idea that we can save somebody, like we're using a um, writing classroom to save those people who speak that broken language, or to save those people you know, who can't write or collect clear thoughts on the page. Paulo Freire argues that, you know, um, if my liberation is dependent upon you, I'm twice oppressed. Not only am I oppressed by the structural conditions, I'm oppressed because I'm a dependent now on someone else to lift me up. Today I want to talk about the deficit theory, though. The deficit theories, because that's what I saw. And this good intention teacher who looked at Derek's page she was operating from a deficit theory. And a deficit theory is this, like some other research that I did. I'm in a high school classroom, in a high school classroom. And the teacher has the students reading Beowulf and we got students with their heads down on desks and other students who are like, uh, some still looking in the air. One student was just like knocked out and snoring. I'm like, oh my God. And I was like, like, like what's, what's going on? She was like, well, they just disengage readers. And I'm looking at them like, they kind of disengage. <laughs> like, like, this must be true. They're disengaged readers. And I begin to think about it. Like, let me get some more information. So I follow these students outside the classroom. And guess what I find them doing? They were reading and writing. They're reading on Facebook and Twitter. And, you know, they were reading, you know, um, books and they were reading like 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 newspaper articles. Some some of the young men could, you know, quote LeBron James stats like preachers quote scripture. I was like, man, they were reading. Fundamentally so they were reading. And it, and it was at that moment I'm like I began to ask a question like like how many of y'all are going to read Beowulf this weekend with me? Mm hmm. That's just what I thought that maybe we don't have disengaged readers, especially if I can find them easily after that classroom picking up text and reading. Maybe the question is disengaged text or disengaged classrooms or disengaged teachers. Perhaps we have the adjective mis misplaced. And what the deficit theory suggests is, is that, 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 we, that we're looking at the individuals as lacking. 
and not the greater structural reality in, um, to which they are responding. Because given another reality, they may respond differently. In fact, they do. How do we move past it? How do we move past deficit thinking? Thankful for us. There's another line of research that consistently points out that all youth, regardless of race and gender, actively read and write. Again, magazines and blogs and raps and identities and so forth. And Connor argues that, you know, black students, particularly the ones that, you know, um, are fiercely vulnerable at colleges and universities and other educational spaces, have also long engaged in learning pro um, processes and practices. But in sets of practices that we too often dismiss, like the symbol systems that sanction urban poverty, and spoken word as well as tattoos and tags and raps, and all of which are um, communicative genres rooted in the black oral tradition of some, um, tonal semantics, narrativizing, signification or signifying, playing the dozens or um, the dozens, Africanized syntax and other communicative practices that linguists like Geneva Smitherman find legitimate. That too often inside of universities we don't. We see them writing early on. Young boys who you heard into our prisons, they start off writing like this, making sense of the world around them and their desires and their interests. And when you know, they get older and, and they confront concepts like language, they write it like this. I got this um, example from a young man's you know, um, diary or journal, he called it. Just writing about language and making sense of it. The same young man didn't write inside of his classroom, but was actually writing outside of it. And when they get older, they read complex texts. Like the Iliad. Another teacher I worked with, you know, this um, class we were supposed to um, teach the Iliad, and she said, Professor Kirkland, how can I get them to, write, to um, read it? I was like, well, your students like comic books. I said, if you want to create access and opportunity points, you know, allow them to translate the Iliad into a comic book, and they created this called the Ill. And all the students read the Iliad. So much so, they were talking about the Iliad outside of class. Imagine this. A group of dudes outside of class talking about the Iliad. One guy was like, you know, I, I, I'm Achilles. The other one's like, I'm Hector. He's like, no, you're a whole like Paris. And the beauty of it is that they use their language to interpret the text, and their interpretation was consistent with the interpretation of literary act experts. Because this term that they call ho, it's the same as coward. And they rightly understood the character and their language. Because of what she sees as a teeming life of literary, literacy among black youth, youth of promise, across vulnerabilities, Anne Haas Dyson has suggested that the literacy gap is an aberration that reflects more accurately cultural derisions in society rather than achievement ones. It's less about who's able to write than it is about who's given permission to. Had Derek's teacher taken a profit approach as opposed to a deficit approach. My sense is that the consequences of his writing in that space would have been different. He wouldn't have been silenced. He wouldn't have feared the practice. He would have engaged in a different way. And a profit approach as opposed to a deficit approach, it, it, it insists upon what students can do as opposed to what they can. What they bring into the conversation as opposed to what they don't. It builds upon what they have, what Louis Moog has called funds of knowledge, or Chris Gutierrez has called repertoires of practice, or Tara Yasso has called community cultural wealth. It's basing the existence of our pedagogy on the wealth that exists in the lives of the people we teach. And that way, from a profit perspective, 
Derek's teacher would have seen the beauty and the brilliance in his poem. She would have seen that the U and U-turn was doing what my colleague Django Paris, you know, um, calls I dialect. More powerful than spelling out Y-O-U, it works as iconography. You can actually see the term. The same thing with sprawling. The definition of the term is implied in, in, in how it's spelled. The separation, the elongation, the sprawl. She would have seen allusions to African-American literature. Langston Hughes, the Negro speaks of rivers, rivers that run deep, allusions to the Holy Bible, Sheba's queen, and empty cups that run over, allusions to popular culture, blues brothers, Tupac's, you know, black is my berry. But more than that, she would have saw that he fulfilled her assignment. He put together a narrative with a definite beginning, middle, and ending. A story of a young man who lost his lover, felt pain because of it, and was able to return, or of a young man who lost his God and found redemption in returning, she would have seen that his narrative was complex and it would have been a place to build from as a place to tear down. So I've been doing this work for a long time. And I usually go into places like this and I'm talking about, you know, access and opportunity, culturally relevant education, using hip hop in the classroom if your students are into hip hop, using tattoos and tags if they're into tattoos and tags, if they're into rock, using rock, I, whatever it is, like creating access points, creating opportunity points. But over the past five years, I've come to learn that that's a beginning and not an ending and it's certainly not enough. Because some of the students that you inherit, you will inherit them hurting. And so you'll create the access point and they won't enter. It's the cage bird syndrome. If you cage a bird forever and all the bird know is a cage, you open up the door, it's not going to come out because all it knows is the cage. Carter G. Woodson put it best. If you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his actions. You don't have to tell him to go out the back door. He'll go without being told. And if there is no back door, he'll cut one out for his own special benefit. For his education has made it necessary. The same is true here. If you're, treating, if you're teaching a hurting student and you bring in the most elegant, culturally responsive pedagogy, it's no guarantee they will learn because they're hurting. Because we know that greater than 80% of learning deals with things beyond cognition, beyond mental ability and capacity. The non-cognitives in composition matter too. Because Derek was like Kendrick Lamar's album. He was a good kid, but he grew up in a mad city. And within that are wounds and sensitivities. Within that space are sets of microaggressions that are inflicted upon the body that in some ways um, begin to create barriers between ability and practice, and we all suffer them. For Derek, it was things like social toxicity. If you're hungry, you can't tell me to write if my belly is growling. If I grow up in a situation like this, you can't tell me to, you know, um, sit down as if and, and participate in a middle class, you know, um, practice like in a, in a leisure. When this is my reality. Not to say that they can't. But simply to say that we have to acknowledge that there are human beings that we're teaching, that we're interacting with, that we're engaging and that those inter and that those human beings have other situations that define their motivations beyond what happens within our classrooms. And oh yeah, the issue of structural violence, that discrimination happens too. If you're a girl, you're often told how you can do it and what you can do. Same thing with boys. My work is around gender and literacy. I see it all the time. Boys are authorized to read and write in certain ways and certain things, and the same is true for girls. 
For a long time, we had this research on math and science where girls were told that they couldn't participate in that. So much so that we believe that their brains just weren't wired to do math and science. What type of bullshit is that, right? The structural violence. And all of this leads to feelings of hopelessness. Sometimes we are inheriting students who feel hopeless. They feel hopeless. Question is, how do we begin to give them hope? How can we give them hope? That, that part of your writing pedagogy isn't just to teach me the Queen's English. Part of your writing pedagogy is to respond to my pain, is to give me hope. And we know that predictors of hopelessness are things like violent behavior. If you're teaching the most vulnerable, sometimes they come in just mad. And I can't blame them. Things like fatalism. They already done, you know, quit. I don't want to play no more. Did activity this morning. I had some people like, like playing games like after a while, it's like, you want to know it? I don't even like your game no more. Like, I don't even like it. I don't, I don't want to play no more. We got students like that. They see the game. They see how it's rigged. They don't want to play no more. The press. Among our most vulnerable students, According to research, about 60% experience some form of depression. Some form of depression. Imagine, you know, creating a writing, um, you know, um, pedagogy that does not respond to the student's mental health. I'm expecting you as a, as a typical, you know, writer to act typically when you're not necessarily typical. If you're, if you're depressed, we got to do some things differently. And then social disengagement. Many don't perform like we want them to perform. They check out. Disengage almost completely. It's like this. They'll be going through their day. Right? Just, just like, so, 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 so that's the, the typical line, right? You're just going through your day. But this is the lifeline. Shit happens. And at that point, you're just trying to survive. Just trying to survive. And it'd be great if they could recover. And better if they can thrive. But the thing is, unless we understand the trajectory of trauma, the, the, the isolation of non-cognitives, you know, um, to the capacity of practicing, you know, um, writing. Unless we begin to think about these things, we don't get them up there to see. We leave them to languish at A. One more story. So I'm giving this talk at a prison. For some reason, they had bought my book, Search Past Silence. The inmates had read it, enjoyed it, I guess. And so they invited me to come in, to give a talk much like this. Um, but we were in a circle, and I, I come in, you know, and I give my talk, and I'm, I'm going through, you know, concepts, and, you know, they talk back to me. They ask a few questions, you know, make some comments. I'm learning probably more from them than they are from me. Our time comes to an end, and this um, prison guard begins to usher the inmates back behind their cages. One young man, he stayed. He's about seven feet tall, 300 pounds. I'm like, this one young man is staying. <laughs> and he begins to walk toward me. And I'm like, oh, shit. Prison guard didn't move, so I, I guess it was OK. And he says, Professor Kirkland, thank you. Your book changed my life, la, la, la. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was great. I loved it. Like, Everything about it is, is amazing. It's like, you know, I try to write as much as I can. I got this daughter at home. I won't see her, you know, for another 25 years. When I see her again, you know, she'll probably be married with some kids, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, ah. It's like, that's hard. And he's like, but sometimes, you know, that gets in a way and it's hard to write. 
And then he said, but I know I got to get over it. And then I stopped him and I said, sir, how do you get over it? And then he reaches into his pocket. And I get scared again. And he pulls out these bubbles. And he begins to blow a cascade of bubbles around my head. And he says, this reminds me of her. And it helps me to get past what I'm going through at that moment. The question for us is, when are we going to give our students bubbles? What are our students' bubbles? The thing that's going to get them to that next place in order to express themselves, in order to, you know, cope with the pain that is associated with particular types of vulnerability and associated with living. If you live in this country these days and you happen to have a faith that's not Judeo-Christian, or if you happen to have a Spanish accent that's suggestive of our southern borders, and you sit in college classrooms, believe me, you have some pain, and you certainly need some bubbles in order to participate. Because pedagogy is a human practice. We're dealing with human beings. Let me get you out of here. Five thoughts. Thought number one, teaching composition, composition in light of Black Lives Matter. And the reason I call it Black Lives Matter because these are the lessons that I'm learning in this resistance, resist moment that we have. It means moving beyond issues of access and opportunity to explore issues of hope and healing. And this means doing what King said. Right. One of the greatest problems of history is that the concepts of love and power have usually been contrasted as opposites. One of the greatest problems of composition is that the concepts of opportunity and access have been contrasted as opposites of concepts of hope and healing. What is needed is a realization that without access and opportunity. What is needed is a realization that. Access and opportunity without hope and healing is reckless and abusive. And that hope and healing without access and opportunity are sentimental and anemic. That the question for us becomes both. How can we, we be culturally responsive as well as humanizing in our approach? Culturally relevant in the ways that Chris. I mean, in the ways that um, Gloria Latson Billings talk about culturally relevant pedagogy. And restorative in the sense that restorative composition pedagogies talk about restorative composition. And even mindful. What we're beginning to learn is that composition instructors who allow their students to meditate before and after class across same, the same dem demographics, their students do better, perform better on writing tasks than students who don't. That if you meditate, like, like mindfulness and meditation, dealing with the humanity, like matters. Thought number two, it means rethinking the basics. And they're not what we think they are. Writing is not a basic skill. It's not a basic skill. So I've written like five books and a bunch of articles now. Some people call me a prolific writer. But before I became a prolific writer, I first fell in love with words. I let the loot of letters like dangle off my tongue, off my larynx. So, so the basics are things like this, pleasure, play, curiosity, creativity. Mm-hmm. If we create spaces that are playgrounds for the practice of writing, that becomes foundation to writing. We, make pe we turn people into lovers of it. I was in a, a classroom. It was a K-12 classroom in the South Bronx. And the teacher is a, a writing teacher. And... One of her students had a question. He's like, miss, 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 miss. I got a question. I got a question. 
And she looks at him, she said, we don't ask questions in here. And something in my stomach sank. Like, if we don't ask questions in the classroom, where do we ask questions? Where do we ask questions? Curiosity is a basic skill. Creativity is foundational. And when students are hurting, things like healing are foundational. Thought number three. It means rethinking notions of place and space and school. Question for us is, how can we begin to cultivate a practice within what Chris Gutierrez has called the pedagogical third space? The space of congruence where we teach our stuff in their lives, where we teach students to write in their lives, not away from their lives. Thought number four, it means interrogating our assumptions about the status quo. Instead of disengage reader, we begin to ask, how are we disengaging readers? Instead of failing students, we beg the question, how are we failing students? In this, we know that one size cannot fit all. That as instructors, we have to differentiate. We have to come prepared to customize our practices, our assignments, our understandings to the unique individuals that sit before us. It will move moving away beyond current conversations because equality is not equity. We can't treat all students the same. And we can't expect them to write the same or speak the same, or be the same. It means exploring new possibilities, like tearing down those walls. And when we do, my hope is we get somewhere like this. Remember Derek. <laughs> Sometimes a man can't be himself in the eyes of the sun because sons were told they should never walk with the switch in cage in their hips. Switch through silence filled alleyways and secluded communities under blacked out skies. The sun isn't too accepting of my nature. Living as a homosexual black male is like a sleeping gazelle in the lion's den, but I refuse to run. Switch, I hide in the daytime. Walk crooked towards masculinity, it's tough When feminine tendencies won't allow me to make a fist Her devil controlling my forearm to hang low like a lynch dream Switch The world evicts you from normality Turns your natural into a disease Tells you your love is a jihad and will never be tolerated How, How do you tame, tame your forest by your passion? passion? How, How do you walk the streets? When the arches of homophobic stairs pierce through your core Creating, creating this, this cocoon, cocoon A hideous premature butterfly that will never be able to ascend in heterosexual skies The testosterone filled wings that flap uncomfortably do nothing but hold me down. So I will switch. I have followed biblical paths and roadmaps searching. I still can't find a damn thing wrong with me. I met a man yesterday. He's got LL's lips in Malcolm's mind. Let my skin envelop his manhood while the hairs on the backs of our necks give us a standing ovation. Switch. Tonight I will live life like the universe was a rainbow playground. Like the colors were drinks at a bar and I will sip until the sun explodes. Take shots until I stumble like an intoxicated skyline. Tomorrow, Tomorrow I will meet the man of my dreams. dreams. Switch. Two men disappear like sound. October 9th, 1998, Wyoming News. Shepherd's skull is smashed with a handgun. Switch. February 16, 2005, Daily News. Hacked up teen found on Nostrand Ave. Switch. Switch. October 12th, 1998, New York Times. Young man dies five days after he was rescued from being tied to a fence. Switch. Switch. February 17, 2005, New York Times. Butchered Bushwick teen on Nostrand Ave identified. Switch. Switch. His name is Matthew Shepherd. His name was Rashawn Brazil. Two men with exploding stars for futures. When I first heard about you were Sean Matthew, your depth so silently as fuses, unsightly explosions of hatred. To save ourselves, we search for splendor. That's Sean, he didn't want to kill you, but when you held him in your arms, you heard the music encaged in your bones. The, the same, same music you switched to. He just wanted to free the melody. Electric song, knowing that your joints, he did it for the music. Separated leg from growing neck, from soul, back to his spine. I swear he did it for the music, limb to bag. Matthew, they couldn't understand your brilliance. 
intelligence the way your intelligence backstroked in your cranium. You were bite like an intoxicated skyline. Those pistol whips cracked the top open like a sunflower seed. Click clacking your desert easel, cock back swing, cock back swinging you into a fatality. There were two men who loved the most standards. The media calls you hack the pistol whip, butcher, gay bash. They never got to mention that you were human. So today, we pick your names into the wind. Listen to the sentimental switch off the tongues of every little boy who saw us to switch in public because sons. Shine hydrogen bomb bright, even when they switch. I want us to remember, in the words of Adichie, the consequence of a single story. This idea of grouping or herding all of our students into the same narrative is this. It robs people of dignity. It makes our recognition of our equal humanity difficult. It emphasizes how different, how we are different rather than how we are similar. Thought number five. It means that we must teach like our lives depend on it. Because too often black lives will. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to uh, Tacoma. But uh, my first question is uh, probably a very basic question. How do you practice this pedagogy in a class where you have uh, students you described, but also you have middle class students who have uh, come through uh, a totally different kind of school system? OK. Um, great, great question. The question was, how do I practice, you know, um, a pedagogy, which I, which I consider to be a pedagogy of both hope and healing, you know, when you have, you know, a diversity of students, right? The, the easy answer, I'm going to save the easy answer for, for life. I mean, and I think there is a really easy answer um, to the question. But, but, but the idea that I think when we confront differences in pedagogy, we have to be willing to differentiate. Right? We, we have to be willing to customize you know, um, our practices. That equality doesn't make it anymore. Equality and equity are different things. You know, remember the slide you know, with the boxes. You know, um, and we can't treat our students equal because they don't come from equal places. We have to give them what they need, and those needs might be different. In fact, we might actually you know, um, do something even more radical, tear down the barriers you know, um, that stand before them, that, that makes, you know, um, their opportunities, you know, um, less legible, you know, um, and create spaces where those opportunities become more legible. So one answer to the question is, is like, as we entertain working with students across lines of difference, we also have to entertain, you know, um, pedagogies that will allow us to differentiate and customize. The other, the, the easy answer to the question is, you know, when we teach for hope and love, like, that's good enough for everybody. That's good enough for the middle class student as well as the vulnerable student. Like, everyone gets to benefit. And in my sense is this, is that regardless of who you are and how you look, you can use a pedagogy that's more compassionate, you know, and that's more connected to who you are and where you are and one that's willing to, you know, um, listen to you in ways that might involve you and evolve you. And so the answer, the easy question is, is that, you know, this rising tide will lift all boats. Hi, I teach at the community college down the road. Um, and I actually have at least six students here also. So I'm so glad that they um, have the opportunity to be in the room with you. Um, they're turning in their first papers next week. Okay. And so what I'm, <laughs> um, you know, what I'm thinking about is, one of the most powerful things, both positive and negative, that we do is comment on their papers. So I'm wondering, you know, what have you learned about, I mean, what, what do you hope, what kind of comments do you hope that these six students and the 75 more that I have get from me? Beautiful, beautiful. I, I love it. Um, and so 
Mikhail Bakhtin, you know, um, writes about dial dialogism, right? Writes about the dialogic. That in some ways, you know, um, discourse is about echoes. That it's in conversation, you know, not only with the social moment, but also the historical one. That in the sense that, you know, um, we're, we're bouncing ideas off of, you know, society and history, you know, um, in really interesting ways. So my sense is that we would create like a dialogic classroom where we create questions that provoke meaning and answer as opposed to, you know, um, hard statements, you know, um, that deliver penalty. Right. So 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 the first part of your 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 your, your um, question, the answer is, you know, what would I do in terms of offering solutions to composition instructors, you know, um, grading or, or providing feedback to students? And that is, is to engage them in a conversation about writing through questions, through inquiry. Right. Right. An inquiry based practice, a dialogic based practice. The second thing that I think is important within that in terms of, you know, um, engaging that practice is to engage them in that conversation. That the onus does not have to be on the teacher. That, that, that young people bring with them a set of you know, um, skills and, and they can be attentive and we want to develop that attentiveness. There's research done you know, um, by the um, Writing Rhetoric um, in American Cultures Research Center wide, um, Writing in Digital Environments at Michigan State University. And what their research is showing that you know, um, response-based pedagogies, right, when students are, you know, learn to give feedback to other students, right, in a dialogic way, those students become better writers because they know the pitfalls and the traps, but they also learn from giving feedback to other people how to engage that conversation. Did that help? Thanks. Other questions? Lots of time. I'll ask a follow-up question to that one. Um, since writing assessment is my, my area, I'm curious about how you see the, um, the presence or absence or the position of grades in the, cl in the classroom, especially around literacy um, acts, um, what, what do you think the relationship is to that and the kinds of things you were showing about the psychology of, of writing that, that, that students bring into the classroom? I should just let you answer that. <laughs> you probably could give a, a, a far better answer to that question than I can. So, so I'm just, I'm just going to shoot out your answer from your research and your work <laughs> is that, that, that grades are, you know, in, in really interesting ways, you know, um, counterproductive to the writing process and, and to the writing practice, right? At least that's what I learned from you. Um, and that there are other ways to go about giving feedback in order to motivate, you know, um, people to, you know, um, write. Like, for instance, your work around grading contracts, like allowing students to work out, you know, um, you know, prearranged agreements about what the duties are and how that negotiation in this social practice will be. You know, um, in addition to that, you know, um, removing this um, course of competition, you know, in order to create more social collaborative sy systems and situations where people are accountable to one another without the pressure, you know, um, of the high stakes A, B, or C. Did I get you right? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Um, that notion of accountability um, is also on my mind the longer I teach and who are we really accountable to because I want, again, these students to have great and meaningful writing experiences, but I also want them to do well after English 101. And the experiences they get in my class, I don't want that to set them up for false expectations or not being able to do their citations properly, yeah. you know, in their future. So I think that's something we all struggle with. Who are we account accountable to? That, that's a beautiful question, right? You know, um, and, 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 there's, and there's a lot in it. So I got, I got a lot to say about it. So I'm going to try to, you know, be quick and, you know, not be so um, pontificous about it, right? Like, 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 like let, let's think about marriage. And let's think about, like, like, in a marriage, if the only thing you do in that marriage is you, 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 you learn to pay the bills. You pay the bills on time, you take out the trash, you wash the um, dishes and you, you cook and clean, but your significant other and you don't ever have you know, intimate conversations or you never hug, you never you know, um, you know, hold hands, 
You don't really know much about each other, but you're like partners. You, you do all the tech, technical stuff for the marriage, but none of the effective stuff for the marriage. Well, that marriage lasts. Right. That, what psychologists are arguing is that, you know, if you do the technical stuff and you don't do the affective stuff within a marriage, that marriage won't last. It won't last. So if you learn the technical stuff of writing without the affective stuff of writing, right, if you just learn the, you know, um, the citations, which are important, but also their reference places to help you learn those citations. If you just learn that, that, that piece, that's one thing. The bills need to be paid. But you also need to engage with a, with a human being that's living and breathing, that the affective work is crucial too. My question is that we put so much emphasis on the technical work and we allow you know, um, the affective work to wilt. And this is the heart of the marriage, right? And we can't, we can't let that thing wilt. We gotta, we, gotta, we gotta invest probably more in that. And the technical stuff, can be taken care of in, in a lot of other ways. The other part of your question is, you know, this relationship between what happens within a progressive writing classroom and the, the world. And I think we sometimes misalign and misinterpret, you know, um, the realities. We believe, and we were just talking about this, <laughs> we believe that we have to hurt students in the classroom because they're going to experience some hurt outside of it. So we're gonna, we're, I'm going to make you do this in this way because when you leave the classroom, people are going to be unforgiving. Well, what really happens when I make you do this in this way, the student end, ends up, or the most vulnerable students end up checking out. And guess what they end up not doing? They end up not doing the stuff that you want to make them to do so that they can work, so that they can have a better life when they leave. So what ends up happening is, you know, you inflict pain upon them. They end up not learning anyway, and then they go into that world that continues to inflict pain upon them. Like what I'm saying is, if we, if we begin to, you know, participate in composition as a human practice, we can help people gain the skills of effective communication in writing and in speaking and listening and thinking. that will transition and translate beyond the borders. That people are usually already resilient. What they, they don't need to learn more resilience. In fact, they need you know, a bit of compassion. They need a lot of connection in order to work it out. Somebody had said, somebody, I, I, would, I, would, I, would, give a talk, I would give talks and you know, people would talk about, you, know, um, you need to learn standard English in order to be prepared for you know, the outside world. Like, no, you don't. No, you don't. If, if McDonald's want to sell a hamburger in the hood, guess what McDonald's going to use? It's going to use the language of the hood. The system that we are accountable to are our audiences. So the language, or, or at least the lesson that our students need to learn is that the audience, you know, um, isn't this assumed thing. Toni Morrison in Playing in the Dark, she argues that the assumed audience of most American literature is, is white. And I believe the same is true when we think about, you know, um, you know, writing, that that the assumed audience when students sit down is, you know, um, some hegemonic, you know, um, you know, displaced elite individual. It's the assumed audience. But that's not the only audience to engage in. And when we're writing, we, we need to be accountable to what those variety of audiences are. Hence, when we land at effective communication as opposed to standardization, we land in a better place. The other issue with standardization while I'm on my high horse. How many of y'all know, you know um, what the term standard means? The original term, standard. The etymology of this term, standard. How about a standard bearer? What is a standard bearer? Someone who carries a flag. So if the bearer of the standard you know, is someone, what is the standard? It's the flag, right? It's the flag, but before it was, and it's usually a flag into battle. The standard bearer is someone who carries a flag into battle, right, into war. Before the standard stood for flag, it stood for the army itself, the phalanx. And what we know about the army is that they had to be of one mind, one mission, a unit. And so the idea here is standardization is to, you know, um, to make things conform 
to a to to a unity that not, may not be you know um scientifically accurate when we think when we think about human you know um diversity, and it may not even be desirable when we think about human society. So when we begin to think about the metaphor of standard and standardization, not only are we building upon a military metaphor, we're building upon a military metaphor that seems to me to be you know in terms of the human vocation just non-attainable. We don't want standardization. We want this rich, dynamic thing that writing can be and that human society is. So I said a lot. I hope I answered your question somewhere in there. To resist and to continue to resist and to fight for what we believe in. Yeah. We, we can have a talk after. <laughs> Thank you. The video. Oh, the video. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. I don't like microphones. Um, well, I just wanted to pose a question because I'm a student here on campus and um, there haven't been any student voices yet. So my question is, um, how do we, what tools do we use to combat this standard that we're supposed to meet? Because, um, for an example, I recently got nominated for Husky, Husky 100, which is kind of saying you're a student that goes beyond and all this great stuff, which I think I deserve. But as I looked at the application process, there's that essay. Or if I'm going to apply to grad school, there's that essay. And I always find myself knowing that I deserve that award, that, uh, that access, that entry. But who's going to read what I'm going to write? Right. And is my story the story that they want to hear? And so what are the tools that I could use to still gain access but still be true to myself and resist not needing to meet that standard? I think that's a beautiful question. And in that question is everything that I just talked about, right? Is everything I just talked about. So let, let, let me start off by saying that, you know, um, a former, you know, a student friend, Donovan Livingston, he gave um, the commencement address at his graduation from Harvard. When he graduated, you know, um, for, with his undergraduate degree, you know, they didn't allow him to say a spoken word poem as his commencement address. Harvard did, and this thing went viral. I think it got over, you know, um, 400 million hits right now. 400 million hits. Um, the poem is called Lift Off. If you all want to YouTube and look it up, you know, um, check it out. He in some ways queered, you know, um, that space and that genre. You know, um, so that relates back to, you know, um, the, the ideologies. Like how we understand, when you said the term essay, what, 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 what signaled for me is that you understand that thing as a particular thing. And, it, and it's a particular thing that you have come to understand, you know, um, that's created, you know, um, a sense of trepidation and silence for you. And, and, that it's, and it's that type of thing that, that is, that's been created that suggests that your voice can't exist in it and that people who read these things, you know, won't listen to you. That's the dynamic, right, that, 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 that we're writing against, that, that we're playing with. Of course you can express why you deserve that award. You just did it. And of course, you can take what you just did and write it and write it. But because they put a particular label on it and because you understand that particular label as a particular thing and the consequences of that particular thing, right? The multiple forms of oppression has created this sense of dissonance between you and it. And therein lies the problem. There and last, the problem is that when we teach writing, we have not, you know, empowered individuals like you beyond those boxes. Because those things are real and they sit in our imagination to create like, you know, um, this, this situation of um, reticence around actually doing that thing. You probably write essays every day and beautifully so. And yet haven't had a chance to hear that in ways that would inspire you to write more. That's all I got. First of all, thank you. Thank you. 
As a young girl, I definitely received the message from my parents who came to this country in their mid-20s and would forever have an accent that I needed to learn English well. I now am an administrator of a school of 100% immigrants and refugees. Have the opportunity with these young people that have not been in the country for more than three years, don't have an original English base to go off of to be their authentic selves. Or in a political climate, as we all well know, that doesn't benefit them. That's right. And I'm struggling, I'm definitely at that equity piece to give them access and opportunity. See the reality of some um, dumbing down the curriculum because they don't speak English, not because they're not intelligent. Yeah. And so inspired by your proposal, I'm thinking, oh dang, how do I even jump there, right? When, when the skills within this language is so limited? Yeah. Beautiful question, beautiful question. Um, what, what, what I'm hearing is, you know, how do you, in some ways, use what the languages that your students have to enrich them? The conversation, this is what I don't want you all leaving here saying, thinking I'm saying. I'm not saying don't learn standard English. I'm saying learn as much language as you possibly can without hurting students. Like, like, like right now, the language pedagogy, especially in composition, it, um, historically, may not be here, but historically, has been if you do not speak in a particular way that reflects a particular community, particular beliefs and particular habits, you're unintelligent, you're inarticulate, you don't write well. That's been, that's, been, that's been the lesson. It's been a lesson. But what I'm saying is that, that, that people who come with languages, when they learn facility and fluency in those languages, become powerful thinkers. And the translation from that thought, that language, that, those thoughts in, that, in, in, a, in their particular language, into another language, it's possible, it's possible that, that we can actually, we can actually have, have classroom spaces where students learn. I'm trying to think about you know, some of the you know, sociolinguistic science, right? I'm gonna connect this to science. Where students learn to write by expanding their linguistic repertoire. Some of the work of Shares Kanagaraja. I think Vashon Young was here, you know, um, it was in, in the fall. In the fall, you know, um, people like, you know, my mentor, Geneva Smitherman, you know, people like Victor Villanueva, you know, who talk, and I mean, some of the best writers and language users I know, who talk about, you know, first starting with, you know, individuals' language, teaching them to think and facilitate conversation and being and personality in the language that is, that makes most sense to them. Creates access points for them not only to engage and master, a wider variety of languages, but also become, you know, um, this thing that, that, that all writers, all good writers should have, and that's confidence. So this is what we know from the science, that students who are allowed to engage, you know, um, writing in their primary language become, you know, um, more fluent writers in a secondary discourse. It's one scientific point. The other point that we know is that students who, um, who are confident about language use, both writing and speaking, are more persuasive. The science, confidence, and a connectedness to you know, um, your home language increases your effectiveness in language writ large. So what does that look like pedagogically? Right. That's the other part that I'm I'm hearing from you. Right. So 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 some of the work around Ophelia Garcia's work, you know, um, from emerging bilingual to, you know, um, trans languaging might be interesting. And it is moving across language borders. 
So within that moving across language borders, the idea is to, you know, um, is, is, is to learn to do things, you know, um, within a particular language space and then be able to cross another language space, you know, um, and do or think those same things. Again, within the science, the sociolinguistic science of it, that's, that's indeed possible. So that's one way. Another way to go about it is, is to, you know, um, what Shiresh and um, Vershawn Young called mesh language. So instead of the linguistic pluralism argument moving across languages, right, is the, you know, it's the hybridity, meshing language, teaching students to, you know, um, to leverage the language that they already have meshing it with other types of languages in order to create a larger linguistic repertoire. A third way is what I call in my own work language management, because I don't care too much for the you know, um, language appropriateness, um, so code switching, or the code meshing metaphors. Like the idea of um, management, what Toni Morrison does. Understanding who you are writing to, right? This relationship between language use and audience, understanding who you're talking to and knowing how to deliver the right words at the right time in order to most effectively communicate to that individual. It's like the difference between saying hi to your boss, hi to your boo, and hi to your mom. You're communicating the same thing, but you're not gonna do it in the same way, right? If you're gonna do it effectively, right? Hope that helps. Just a second, the mic is coming. Yeah, I'm also kind of carrying on this dialogue about how to respond to that kind of classroom. Uh, in disability studies, uh, we have been talking a lot about how uh, L2 learners or multilingual learners, their needs and uh, needs of uh, people with disabilities at times they intersect so, so much that some of the techniques that are used in uh, disability studies, they, they are equally applicable in these classrooms. And I am father of four uh, boys who I have been raising right here bilingually. Uh, these techniques work. That uh, multimodality somehow stops at the door when we start talking about L2 learners. I don't know why. Uh, why don't we use in the classroom mime, theater, music, yes. Yes. gestures that can actually bring some of this language these uh, students bring from other places also to our local students, that uh, we don't remain the kind of uh, 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 silo we live in called United States that only English is the language that schools will speak. Sorry. I, I, I co-sign that 100%. Co-sign. <laughs> Everything he just said. <laughs> we have like a couple more minutes officially, of course. Um, we can linger afterwards if you have to want to speak one-on-one. -on -one. Any other? Okay. One more. Um, so I have, we have uh, some colleagues and students from Tacoma Community College in the room, and the students, um, I bet, are wondering, because we're talking about them, and, you know, I'm, I'm wondering what thoughts you have for them who are going to be experiencing all these different kinds of classrooms, some where, you know, they're not, they're not feeling the love. I love mean, what, what are your thoughts, what what's your advice for the, the students in the room? Beautiful. So... A, a, a few things, right? I get to college, come from Detroit, and I got this real heavy Ebonics a accent. Before I met Geneva Smitherman, I didn't meet her until like 93 when I got to Michigan State. I thought I didn't have a language. And so here, I'm, I'm, I'm in this space and people speak differently than me and I, and I learned that, at least at that time, that Whatever education I had didn't matter that, you know, I was, in, I was intelligent, I wasn't bright. I meet Geneva Smitherman, she teaches me that I have a language and my world is blown. Like I have a language and it's systematic and it's rule governed and, 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 and all of this stuff and it can express like these amazing things. What I would say to the students is don't let go of your confidence. Know that you have a language. You have a language by virtue of your humanity and the fact that you exist and you live in a community where language is used. 
and lead with that, right? And lead with that. And always be working to refine it and refine the message that exists within it. Like struggle, like, like in hip hop, we talk about, you know, just being ill, ill MC, that it takes some work, like work. Work to innovate that language so that it can, you know, um, do the work for you to communicate the ideas that you have. Stephen King said that, you know, um, language is like magic. With it, you have the ability to um, transport your thoughts into the body of someone else. I'm like, dang, like magic. And I would say to students, like, like um, master the magic of your, of your reality. Master the magic of your language so that you can transport thoughts into the minds of other places. Because your language and your mind is where the battleground of liberation starts. Steve Biko probably said it best. The most potent weapon of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And through your language, not only do you win back your mind, you can win over others. The American computer scientist, Alan Kay, said the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And we invent that future linguistically. So know your language, love your language, have confidence in it, and grow it. Uh, hello, and thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, I am very curious about, since you talk about the literacy of black men or boys, could you talk a little bit about the contrasting differences between black boys and uh, black girls? Beautiful. Or even, you know, um, other genders, right, beyond the binary, right? Definitely. Um, so it's a really good question. It's one of those questions that I get a lot. You know, um, and one thing while my work focuses on, you know, um, and, and at least that study, you know, black men, you know, and boys, I think equal attention needs to be pay paid to, you know, um, other vulnerable groups or other groups marked as vulnerable, the poor, you know, um, the disabled, um, transgender, you know, um, students and students of, you know, um, other sexual or gender identities. Um, people of a variety of religious groups, right? And so while I talk about it here, it does not mean, you know, um, that their practices don't matter. And we know um, from the science of intersectionalities that these things sometimes conspire, that they intersect. And so the location of this one identity, you know, um, shouldn't be, you know, um, used to displace the other identities. That indeed, you know, um, our capacity, you know, um, for literacy, you know, um, our capacities that, you know, um, are centrifugal and centripetal, right? The heteroglossia is real, you know, when we begin to talk about, you know, um, literacy as it relates to identity, right? And so I don't want to, I don't want to like suggest, you know, um, that this group is, you know, um, that this group deserves more attention than another group. I hope I didn't do that. Um, in terms of, you know, the relationship, in terms of comparing the two, I think that we, we socially construct, you know, um, sets of opportunities and access points that govern certain consequences. We tell boys that they can't read particular things, like romance novels or the color pink. <laughs> and I like to rock pink all the time, time too, right? We tell, we tell girls... Like I said earlier that, you know, you don't do well in this subject or that subject or you're not supposed to be an MC or, or this, but we know they can rap too. They got skills. They can flow, right? You know, and, and so within, you know, the ways that we've constructed, socially constructed opportunities and access points and, you know, practices um, based on the transsectional gender reality, you know, that we li live in fluidly, you know, um, constructs outcomes and we deal with those outcomes, but the best thing that we can do is understand that these things are human, um, that they are human constructions. And as human constructions, they can be deconstructed and reconstructed anew, where opportunities and affordances can be made, you know, um, widely and more available. So, I mean, that's the best I have for that question, right? Is that, you know, there's some, there some, some socio-political stuff that we've created that complicates you know, um, the practices of writing, you know, um, based on the body that you inhabit, 
you know, um, and if we want to bring justice to, you know, all bodies, we have to do the work of deconstructing what those limits are, you know, for particular bodies. I think that's it. Thank you all for your time. Yeah.